we've done a couple of these and um what we tend to do is just um sort of tell you a bit about our history really how we began what we do and um sort of where the background came from so i sort of flick between sort of pictures and back and forwards uh, and things like that so um if i just go straight into you can all see that is that yeah we've we've got uh, it yeah so um i actually uh started off life in sailing and so without knowing it flying as well but um i actually spent the first sort of 17 years uh british team sailing uh building my way up right from sort of the age of five sailing a multitude of things from this which is all carbon and flies um twin trapeze boats uh all the way through um that's my poor wife being subjected to uh a bit of a uh, bit of shouting um and to sort of classic yachts from 1913 all wood um previous owners of these sort of boats uh, uh Sopwith um going back unfortunately there's a couple of bad owners uh, a couple of Hitlers and things like that have owned a couple of these boats but um stunning bits of kit but when I got to sort of um you work your way up through the British team and then you can sort of overdo it and I completely overdid it and um, my dad has always been gliding. He started off at Woodford, <clears throat> moved to uh, Shobden, then to Parham. And um, I basically got to go when he was at Leon Solent, which is 15 minutes away from where we are now. And uh, got to go, got solo, and absolutely love it. It's, um, and what's uncanny is the amount of glider pilots I meet that are either ex-sailors or current sailors. I, I think it's just the same feel it's it's just lovely so very lucky uh, i fly from lasham just we'll leave that bit out don't hate me for that and um yeah and, and so very privileged we've got a number of very uh very nice friends that lend us their kit this is uh, g dale's ash so this was just before the lockdown um in november we were up and down the south downs uh, my dad and i do a bit of a boys trip every year to hacker so that's always good fun. Um, there are the occasional trips which we get through um, because of what we do with the covers delivering and uh, people always ask us if we want to have a go. Um, sometimes we say yes and we regret it. So uh, this, I'm pretty sure after this flight, I really couldn't see very straight for uh, a couple of hours. It's uh, yeah, an extra. I recommend it as an experience, but um, yeah it, it's certainly a good way of breaking you but um it was <clears throat> as i was going solo at leon solent um my dad was sort of saying well have a look at these covers and the reason for that was i took a gap year between college and university and because of the sailing i worked for a local company which is actually now about 20 meters the other side of that wall uh, and they were sail makers and they were boat cover makers, um, but they also did some really quite special projects as well, football pitch covers, we did Wimbledon uh, tennis court covers, we did the London 2012 opening ceremonies, we've done Rugby World Cup opening ceremonies, so a real uh, array. And it was when I started doing my solo uh, course at Leon Solent, my dad sort of pointed out the glider covers that were there and sort of said, well, the club are in need of some do you think you could do any better so coming from the sailing where pretty much everything gets destroyed you have to use the best of the best um we just sort and of approached when, it. when was this it was two, 2005 so okay. um i was 17 18 at that point so right in the middle of my gap year 2005 and yeah, we just, I just made the first few um, and just as a trial, I was just trying to get my head around it. And um, during one of the trial fits, the CFI came along and went, oh, that's brilliant. Would you be able to do us a few? We're off to uh, a canyon in a couple of days and we need some protection. And, uh, and that was it. Those were the first covers all the way back in 2005 out in a canyon, just canopy covers, just keeping dust and everything else that comes in Spain off it and um, 
that was where it began really we sort of did those um and then everybody at leon solent started upgrading their covers so we had to start upping our game and all of these were built on the lounge floor of my parents house <laughs> so sewing machine out all over the place cutting materials trying not to catch my mum's carpet and uh, trying not to leave little staples or anything lying around and um, luckily at this point here people were only interested in sort of cockpit covers as time went on we got into the full sets and obviously there was no way you could do wings on the lounge floor so um, that was where after um, my gap year had finished at this point I had started university and uh, I'd sort of done that as a, a backup and so I, I got my first factory which was about a mile from here just down by the River Hamble, an old sailmaker's loft and, um, and we started so I'd sort of be working in there then I'd run across to uh, the local university trying to do that bit of my education come back backwards and forwards um, and then as we grew and grew we needed sort of some more machinists so I sort of run in there in the morning set them up disappear to university come back at lunchtime check everything's okay go back forwards after two years it, I, I just had to <laughs> we just had to draw a line under one of them and um, it was always for me always going to be the university that had to stop so we just went we just went full bore into the glider covers um, and we were very lucky that right from the beginning we developed this material with the manufacturers and we really focused in on what we needed to do and it's still the same material we use now um, we were just very fortunate that we sort of got it right first time um, little tweaks along the way and little changes to the inner liners but that was fundamentally where where it all began it was Leon Solem then people sort of naturally migrate to different gliding clubs for a weekend or something like that and then people would see the covers and it just sort of grew from there um and at this point we were very much still making the covers in a traditional way so we take the roll of plastic to the aircraft and roll it out over over the aircraft and then we start building up the panels um putting in darts like you can see just above the windows here there's a, a, a fold across the uh, plastic there and we just really start to build up the patterns using plastic it gets quite tricky when you get up to sort of 747 size and it's sort of 15 knots on an airfield that that can that can get quite interesting quite quickly but for a, basically until now this is very much the way we do it it's it's super reliable um, when I roll up that bit of roll of plastic just down to the left there, I can roll that up, put it in my suitcase and go anywhere in the world. Customs don't care. Nobody's interested. It just looks a bit weird. You're going on holiday with a bit of plastic, but it's it's super easy. Um, and of course, if the air, air, um, airline decide to lose my bag, it's only a bit of plastic. It's not uh, it's not sort of end of the world. And normally it's happened once and I've been able to go to a local sort of B&Q, pick up something plastic <laughs> and get the job done and get home. Um, so, yeah, we still pattern in this manner um, and then we'll come back to the factory. Open it all up and we tweak the plastic, making the panels uh, that eventually have the extra seam allowances that we then build the covers from. Um, and it's just a fantastic way of doing it. The, there are limitations. Wind, uh, rain can be a bit of a pain because we marker pen on top of the plastic. So as soon as the plastic's wet, the marker pens just refuse to work. So you sort of uh, invariably go through quite a few of those while you're trying to get it done, especially if you've driven 250 miles, you'll, uh, you'll burn through a couple of pens trying to get it done. But from here, we we use this is where we use the material that we began with so we very much chose a woven material um there's a lot of benefits to that um you get the durability um so if you were to put a hole in this it's not just going to split like a plasticized material you've got the water resistance and the breathability and the breathability is key uh on glider covers especially and all covers but when we first started in 
2005, the sort of the covers out there were not breathable. And to be honest, they still really aren't. And they're very much causing issues to the makeup of the aircraft, especially gel coats. Um, so we always wanted breathable and we always wanted durable. And this is what we landed upon and we tweaked. And there are many other added advantages. It, it stops all the UVA and UVB from getting through this to the aircraft as well. Really noticeable on uh, like a red powered aircraft. It, when someone just goes for the cockpit cover, after a year or two, you take the cockpit cover off and you can see a perfect line of perfect red paint, faded red paint. Um, so it, it's, it's perfect, at, uh, especially if you take, I don't know, gliders to Rieti, South Africa, um, New Zealand, where the UV is just so strong, uh, even for short stays, um, it's really important to um, use the right materials. Um, and then later down the line, this material is really good because you can wash it and reproof it. Um, a lot of the plasticized materials, you can't do that because you're basically putting a waterproof coating on top of a bit of plastic. So as soon as you, you know, rub it against the grass or anything like that, it just comes straight off. Whereas this goes straight into the weave uh, and works beautifully. Of course, with a breathable cover, you will always naturally get moisture inside a, a wing box or anything like that. You've got, a, you've got a volume of air inside the glider that naturally, as it cools down, gets damp. If your covers aren't breathable, that moisture gets trapped inside the cover and will always be there until you take the covers off. The beauty of the breathable cover is it's constantly working to wick that moisture away and just keep reducing that humidity with inside the aircraft. Um, and that's ultimately what protects the finishes um, and prevents them from you know, degrading with moisture uh, and then the UV. So we worked very hard on that material um, to, uh, to get what we wanted and we're still there. And we use this material for gliders, and the whole range of everything we do, which is quite extensive. So we've got our sort of standard glider covers, LS7, and I think that's a mini Nimbus. Um, and with the covers, um, we do many different things. So you can have competition numbers, which seems to be super popular at the moment. That's a real, um, you know, people are really focusing in on having nice competition numbers on their fins, so quite like to replicate that on the cover. It's also quite a good way of preventing your covers going walkabout or somebody picking them up by accident. Um, solar panels, that tends to be quite a uh, popular choice. Um, I think this is on the back of a DG1000. So again, the materials we use for that come from the marine world where they're designed to be outside uh, all the time. So perfect against high and low temperature, um, but allows, allows the right light levels to get through to the solar panel without affecting the resistance on the cover. Um, and then with the gliders, we also do the hangar covers, which again is a completely different technology because you're not trying to fight off uh, the rain, uh, ice and snow and things like that. You want them to be quick and easy to put on uh, just because when you're done, you just just want to get back to the clubhouse so really quick and easy to put on machine washable um and yeah sort of um these are all at lasham and the new hangers there um so yeah we just try to make it really nice and easy for those of course with the gliders we do the shiny canopy gloves which um came about from actually from g dale he was off to uh rieti uh, for I think it must have been a Europeans many many years ago maybe 15 years ago um, and from his memory he'd get into situations where his cockpit just he could not open the canopy because the perspex had swelled so much so we started making these and um, we went for the option of as you can see here uh, all the way around the canopy because that cockpit area there it swells below the cockpit sorry, below the canopy frame. Uh, and also if you just were to put a cover around the canopy frame, it looks really cool, but of course you can't lock the canopy. And then if someone toes out, you might 
a canopy might bounce and uh, and fracture. Um, again, another canopy cover in uh, on a DG thousand. So for the gliding, that was where that's where we began. Uh, so we started producing the glider covers at Leon Solon, then to Lasham. I personally then moved to Lasham to uh, fly, and of course Lasham in the corner has um, ATC Lasham, which then became 2XL, and doing all the 737 maintenance. And we have a bit of a habit here of sort of saying yes and then asking what the question is. And, you know, we were quite happily making glider covers and um, build a cover for a guy who was an engineer there. And he said, ah, oh, we've got a problem with our 737 covers. Do you think you could do those? I was like, How hard can it be? Let's have a go. And then we started there. Um, and at Lasham, they had a helicopter maintenance place, so we did helicopter, and it just always just seemed to sort of grow from there. So powered aircraft covers, same material again, uh, just different colours available. Um, we want to keep the glider covers uh, an off-white. It's, it's just the best for heat resistance. You don't want any heat buildup, especially um, with the thin sort of acrylic and gel coat finishes. But powered aircraft being aluminium or quite thick fiberglass or gel coats, um, they can just resist that heat that little bit more. So people have a choice of colours, although you'll see a habit of basically blue is super popular. And uh, although there are 23 colours, everyone seems to go blue. But um, and blue again, um, Gordon MacDonald from Lasham. Um, you might have come across Gordon. He loves lime green. That's his bonanza. <laughs> um, beautiful bit of kit, completely restored. It's um, yeah, gorgeous. Gordon, the technical director at the BGA. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. Yeah. I think the stitching inside is lime green. I, th I think uh, there's some trimming that's lime green. I think his Cirrus is lime green. He's got a K. Oh, I can't remember. It's not K13. It's something else. It's all yeah. There's a running theme. <laughs> Um, we do high wings, low wings, um, the list goes on. Light aircraft, uh, sorry, Cirrus, of course, um, and that's the light sort of silvery colours that people go for. Um, but then from there, we sort of started getting into helicopters. So this one here um, was one of those where it was like, right, we've got a helicopter. It's going to sit on the back of a super yacht and we've been struggling really badly with salt water killing it basically every year the maintenance costs are horrendous do you think you can cover basically everything belly everything but the legs it's like yeah let's have a go incredibly intricate because most powered aircraft even airliners you've always got a decent position to put a cover on but of course with the helicopter especially when you're getting to the rotor head you've only got these normally just two tiny little sort of foot loops to get your, your toes only just really go in there to get up. And of course, you're trying to lift covers up there. Um, so yeah, really tricky um, way of producing covers. Helicopters always give us sort of the most headaches because they're always different. They've always got some, each side has different things on. It's um, yeah, really um, quite a tricky thing to uh, produce a cover for. But um, private jets is another item that we do. Um, they're always good fun, uh, mainly because when you go to pattern the engines, then normally, awkwardly, the leading edge of the engine just starts behind the trailing edge of the wing. And you can't quite get a pair of steps in. You can't, if you stand on the back of the wing, because of the trailing edge uh, sloping away quite hard, you can't reach and you're there with your roll of material trying to hold it and it's blowing. Um, yeah, always, always good fun. But um, yeah, they, they definitely provide the most entertainment, I'd say. Um, and of course, they're not cheap bits of uh, equipment. So of course, whenever you go anywhere near any aircraft with a ladder, people get nervous. So it then makes you nervous. And then <laughs> it's uh, you're just trying to avoid any accidents. Um, and of course, for us, in the, especially in the last 12 months, given what's just happened, um, our commercial airline covers. So this was very much one of those 
at Lasham as a, it just came from nothing. And um, we started doing them. And the first time we did them, I think XL Airlines, Zoom, there were three airlines went bust all within a week of each other. And they all got stored uh, at Lasham. So it was sort of a baptism of fire because it wasn't just make one, let's see how it is. It was, crikey, we've got a whole load to do here. Um, but it was actually quite a turning point for us because at this point we were operating out of a reasonably small sail loft um, that had some really annoying traits, which was every time it rained, it leaked. The leaks always seemed to end up over plugs. Um, so it was very much sort of time to move on. And this job sort of spurred that on because we needed the space. And that's when we arrived where we are now, which has been a good 10 years. Um, and it just gave us the, the space to do these bigger projects, which um, I mean, even now they just, the space just seems to evaporate. But since then we've become, um, we were approached by Boeing to start producing. And during this whole pandemic, of course, tons of aircraft have parked up, um, aircraft coming off the production line in Boeing and Airbus every day. So the problem gets worse. Um, so yeah, for the last 12 months, we've just been inundated producing these. Um, and of course it's quite tricky. So because I was normally on my own when I was delivering these, um, they're all designed to be fitted by one person because that was the only way I was ever going to be able to do it at sort of nine o'clock at night as we're sort of taking them straight off the uh, production line and straight to the airfield. Um, so yeah, every we can do pretty much up to 747 on your own now, um, which is something we, we push for quite hard. Um, so yeah, gets quite tricky. Uh, and of course, the airfields where they tend to store these now are quite ex usually pretty exposed. So um, they've got to take quite a battering and of course sometimes the ground handlers aren't that kind to them either so we have to build that with uh, with it in mind but again this is still the same material that we use um, for the gliders and good old 747s bless them uh, i don't think we'll be doing many of those anymore but um this was probably this was our second commercial engine set of covers we had to make so it was quite a jump from the 7.3 then the guy said oh do you think you could do 747s so okay we'll have a go um luckily they're all the same the engines but templating it again was a nightmare Bournemouth airport really exposed on the worst parallel I think that's the ladders there underneath the fuselage just awful um but yeah good fun and uh even more fun to fit. So from there, again, could you do this? We ended up doing leg covers. So because of the length of time these aircraft are now having to be stored, um, they've really got to uh, seal these from the elements. So it started off with wheel covers, then was it could you do the legs, then the actuators, and uh, it gets quite intricate, but um, it's it's always good fun because when we use the plastic to template it, we use a lot of the electrical tape and electrical tape is fantastic. It will never damage the paint or do anything like that. It's only nemesis is grease. And these legs are the, the thickest grease you've ever seen in your life. I, I think I've destroyed five or six high-vis jackets just trying to pattern these things. Um, you touch it and it's just, it will not come off. So yeah tricky again um but uh yeah really critical to what they're trying to trying to protect uh another slightly random thing we do is uh blimp socks so um this blimp here will be above new market race course goodwood race courses and underneath is suspended the cameras for the tv uh, and then what they try and do is just to sort of um, help the sponsor a bit is they 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 put a cover straight over it um, to advertise and um, get a bit more publicity, um, hoping that people sort of are looking up and not really watching the racing. Um, these ones are quite nice. They're quite Qatar Airways. It's quite a nice logo um, because that's 17 metres long, nose to tail. 
I had to make, uh, I don't know if have you seen Vitality, uh, the advert, uh, quite often it's on, um, it's basically got a sort of a sausage dog and I had to make a 17 meter sausage dog to go on the side of that thing, which is a nightmare because if you put it slap on right on the center line, when it's up at sort of, um, sort of 200 feet, of course you won't see it. So it actually needs to be more at sort of, um, sort of five o'clock, sort of, sort of three to five o'clock is a really good angle, uh, depending on where it is. But yeah, that 17 meter dog sort of haunts me because it was, you know, we had a week to do it and um, you, you don't know until you put it on, you just don't know if you've got it right or not. And you could end up with a bit of an embarrassing mess. But Bet Victor, um, that was another good one. Um, the, the funny thing is, I still don't know how they put them on. We just build them. <laughs> I dread to think how they get those on uh, easily. But um, yeah, uh, the red, of, uh, of course, with the black, sorry. You've got to be careful because the material will heat up and change shape. So um, it's quite critical that they launch them quite early in the morning so that the balloon is at the correct shape before uh, the daytime sun gets in. Um, so um, because we've made a shift with the um, airlines going to sort of more composite uh, construction, so tailplanes and things like this, um, it means the sort of repair procedures have also changed. So um, this is a clean room for um, a Dreamliner uh, elevator, which got hit somewhere in the UK. Um, and basically Boeing have designed uh, a repair structure, which means you have to do it within a clean facility. Um, and, uh, and then this is what we did for them. So really nice. I think that weighs about 45 kilos. So it's actually 12 meters long, but you can put it in the boot of a car. And so really agile little building um, that you can use inside or out. Uh, really simple construction. And basically, like a bouncy castle, you, you continually blow air into it, and that's how it keeps the structure. If you were to make it like a, just like a blow up, so you're welding the seams, um, the time it would take would be huge. Um, and the problem we have is when these are used in a rush, there's a high risk of them damaging it. And of course, with a continually blown structure, it will take a, a reasonable tear and still continue to work. Whereas if it's a blow up, like a blow up bed, if it's got a hole in it, you can't use it at all. So that sort of uh, method has sort of gone on into, well, significantly larger structures. So when an airliner has a, an engine issue or whether it's just happens to have come up to its hours and needs changing, there aren't many hangars around the world now that are capable of taking Dreamliners um, and larger aircraft. And because of the fuel efficiencies, um, most airlines now are starting to look at a Dreamliner and a 737, well, MAX, because you've got the efficiency and you've got short haul and long haul. Um, I'm pretty sure a 787, I'm pretty sure that went direct from San Fran to Oz recently, I think, or so it's done the longest single fly. Um, so I think that's going to make up quite a lot of people's um, fleet. Um, but basically, when you have to make these changes and there's no hangar available, but the book and the manual says you've got to do it in a hangar like condition, that's where this comes in. So it's an inflatable structure. It's in a rock and roll box, a bit like you see uh, bands turning up in. So take the lid off roll it out and you can go from uh, the box to fully installed like this in 10 minutes. So it's really rapid, um, continually blown uh, and you can light it, you can heat it, you can do all sorts of things. So on the Dreamliner, it was quite big. We then went even bigger to 747. And of course the 747 has the added complexity of inboard outboard motor that is a, a engine which is a meter difference in height um, so we have these uh, inflatable skirts up high where the wing cuts through and that basically allows you you can pull valves which close those and that allows you to take in consideration of not only the meter difference from the inboard and the outboard 
but of course you've got a left and a right wing that you want to use the same structure for and as you can see here obviously the leading edge is much further forward on the left than it is the right um so yeah it gets quite big this is 150 kilograms something like that but you can install it three people can pull it back over the aircraft and um and it doesn't take long the the previous image this one was in um this was in sweden and it was minus 10 and inside we had to take our jackets off within minutes because it was just too hot um so yeah this this was a bit of a uh, this really got the mime working this one because of the different heights uh and then this has to work according to their specification in Siberia. So they wanted seriously cold and seriously windy, um, which is why it's quite like a cathedral. It's quite high so that any snow just dissipates straight off the side of the building. Um, What's weighing yeah. the bottom down, Andrew? Sorry? What's weighing the bottom uh, part of the structure down? So what we have is it's got upward pressure underneath the wing. And then we've got these skirts that you that come out on the outside. And basically with the skirts, what you can do is, well, like in the background there, you can see a, a scissor lift or something like that, or a vehicle or water. You can just drive those straight on top of the skirts that are lying out and then it just can't take off. Um, we've also got, um, if you look from the base up, I think it's about one, I think it's about a meter up or maybe 1.8 up, um, you've got D-rings or triangles along. And what you can do with carabiners is hook on and then go down to water weights. Um, and in Siberia, I think the services at airfields perhaps were not great. So they very much wanted stuff that they could just tie anything to, whether it was a generator, it was a bit sort of um, a bit Cub Scouts at that point, because most airfields, you can ask the fire truck to come over and we've, we make long sausages that you can fill with water um, or Boeing were using sort of sandbags uh, and um, you know on temporary fencing where you have those rubber feet that you drop the fence into um, the sort of uh, high density rubber they were using those um, and just stacking them up on top um, it is nerve-wracking when it's windy putting it up because you think if this thing gets away from me, it's it's into the next postcode. But um, we um, we always the aircraft always gets positioned normally nose into the wind, and you you enter you basically inflate it in front of the engine, and then you can basically use the wind to assist you to go back over the wing, and then all these different elements sort of inflate and crush and basically uh, compact around the wing um, just to give you that water resistance good question uh, for me, me andrew yeah what power source do you always have to have a generator or is it battery powered or so um you can do two different things um so we've got um diesel run ones um which are currently out in the arctic um they're quite good you just have to keep an eye on it because especially as the temperature drops the fuel burns quite high um and it, they only come with little reserve tanks so you're better off putting it in an auxiliary but the, the main way these are run are with an electric fan, just a high volume blower. And actually when you pull the plug, because each of these seams, although they're sewn, they're then glued. So just because if you stood next to it, the last thing you need when you're trying to have a meeting is the seam whistling in your air and air sort of high pitch whistles. So they're all glued. So actually if you pull the plug, it doesn't just suddenly go like this. It just sort of gradually sort of gets softer and softer. Um, so you do have time to, to sort of run around and see what who's pulled the plug out or um, did we run out of fuel or something like that. Um, and those tend to be the two main sort of ways they're done. Um, I'm just trying to see. So, and then on the front, We've obviously got a sort of an exit hatch where you can leave the structure in place to remove the engine. And actually on the left there, you can see one of the blowers. So that green um, blower is completely water resistant. We had them in the Arctic and they were sucking in snow and it didn't seem to affect the uh, performance at all. 
Um, and then, of course, the um, the main thing with these is everyone ribs us. You know, we pull the plug, pull them out of the way, and everyone's like, "Go on, then get that back in the box," because it's just like any old inflatable. But you'll see that red vertical stripe on the side there, and there's about six or seven of these around the structure. They're just great big zips that you just open up and all the air dumps. So you pull it away from the engine, pull the plug, undo the zips. And then rather than sitting there struggling, you just start tidying up your cables and things like that. And after about five or six minutes, quite a lot of the air's gone anyway. Um, and then you just flake it up and roll it. Um, and the trick is to roll it. The last roll is the one that puts it into the box. Um, so that you're not trying to lift the thing um and so we another one this was for tui um or thompson as they were um so the dreamliner again which was where it began um and it's i quite like this sort of structure because it looks more sort of armadillo-y and quite cool the other one was just by the nature of the height involved was sort of you couldn't be too aesthetic about it it was it's all practicality um the same thing for a 737 and we do this slightly differently so those other structures because we're going so high we need the rigidity so we have a an inner wall an outer wall and then a membrane in between and basically it forms rectangles it's a square tube running around the structure um but of course over a meter squared you've got three bits of material so the weight is quite high this structure here is actually a tubular frame sewn together that we again inflate with air and it's got a cover over the top. So this one is much lighter, uh, sort of, well, two of us can easily lift it into the boot of the car. Um, and it's super rapid. It's, it's just straight up. And uh, in Ireland, we had to help Boeing to prove that it was absolutely safe to use on the airfield because I think somebody else had had a go at making one and it did end up in the next airport and typical i flew over there hoping let's just hope there's a it's a nil wind day and we can just show them the methods no it's 30 knots I was just like, oh god this is this is going one of two ways so even when you're confident in what your product can do you're still there just like please you know so we had a little briefing before just like guys you've got to keep the weights on don't let go of it until it's all fully held under the wing um, and yeah, sure enough, put it under there and health and safety and the airport and things like that. Took one look at it and went, yeah, that's fine and walked off and uh, didn't even want to see the thing come down, which was, uh, which is probably more tricky than putting it up. But um, yeah, it's uh, a much neater little air um, thing. So we've got a couple of other products like that, but I'll come on to those a bit later on. They were a bit more exciting, um, but we often get Back to the sort of say yes and ask what the question is later. Um, I don't know if you follow, but on YouTube, there's uh, Stefan Drury, who's an Australian guy. He's got a SR22, uh, flies around. Um, he was hoping to fly around the world, but uh, that's on pause. He always flies. I think his daughter gave him a little cow that sits up on the, on the uh, top of the instrument panel. And uh, he wanted a cover. And he said, oh, would you be able to sort of match my branding? It's like, yeah, yeah, what's your branding? It's a cow. So it was like, oh, God. So we, we sort of, we didn't go all over. We just went for the uh, sort of subtle cow splodges um, over the back quarter, which was um, a little bit tricky, but good fun. Um, and that was just done by hand. So we just, we just sort of stencil it up and put it on and uh, just sort of see what looks best. Um, and then this is it in Australia on his aircraft, um, recently featuring in quite a few of his videos, uh, which is always quite strange to see because all of our stuff goes worldwide. So um, it's always nice to hear, you know, we only ever see it in the UK when we're at competitions or visiting clubs. But of course, you know, these things are in some really weird and wonderful places. Um, so it's always nice to see. And then the big one for us, which was great fun, was the Red Arrows. And um, that came about, they contacted us and said, we've got this requirement. We've got a, a current cover that um, is very MOD, very old school um, and a very old design with metal buckles and things like this. And it's causing all sorts of damage. Do you reckon you can you know, do something better? 
So he turned up at Scampton, which I'm glad because I don't think Scampton's um, too long for this world. So it's quite nice to have had the privilege of being there. And um, I patterned it. So they were quite, it always draws attention. As you start wrapping it up, the common question is, oh, are you sort of stenciling it off ready to be sprayed or packaging it up to be shipped away or something like that? And uh, it's like, no, no, we're doing the cover. And um, it was really interesting. So by this point, you want to do it quietly in the corner, but there's now 30 people watching you. And of course, the pen's okay. The stapler's a little bit heavier, but the scissors in your back pocket are always your sort of nervousness, especially if you do something like a hurricane, then that's going through the top of the wing, out through the bottom, and the world's most expensive bill is coming your way. And so it always makes you nervous. But we sort of, we did the pattern and I said, do you know what? because they couldn't decide how it was going to look. I said, I'll just build you a sample. Um, that way you can see what it is. And I get a really nice picture of it on the aircraft and uh, no matter what happens. And, and then the, the biggest discussion was all the artwork. So they had the diamond nine on the windshield and they wanted the round all at the back. Um, this is actually my TV at home because on the American tour that they did, uh, they did a whole series on it. And um, the covers started to sort of pop up quite nicely, which is really cool. Um, my only criticism being a cover maker is that above the Royal Air Force bit, the uh, the buckle there is a bit too tight and causing some creases. If they could have just let that off a little bit, <laughs> it looked look that little bit nicer. But um, a really cool project, uh, uh, amazing group of individuals. And, um, uh, and the result of this was, of course, after the American tour, they looked at the engine intake cover there and went that's pretty hideous we need to get vertigo back to do something that matches that's nicer than that old mod green um but yeah really good fun um the blue was a choice because when when the pilots are not involved in the aircraft it's the responsibility of the blue engineer and it's kind of a nod to them to say, you know, thank you. This is you. This is your moment in the in the light. Um, and also the other issue is if we've done a red cover, the red material is bright red and the red arrows are, are slightly faded but up close. And so the two would contrast really badly, uh, whereas which is the same with any aircraft. If you've got a blue aircraft and a blue cover that's not quite the same color, it will look pretty horrible. You're better off just going completely different color. Um, but yeah, really good fun. They took them out to training in Greece and then they went off on the America tour. Um, and uh, yeah, really good fun. Uh, this was a, a very patriotic guy, um, loved Russia, um, said, oh, would you be able to put a cut? The, the term was a couple of stripes on my cover which then turned into the, the, the whole cover basically becoming the flag, um, which does get quite tricky when you've got panels running vertically or seams running vertically that you then need to get aligned, especially with a blue and a white. Within From four miles away, you'd be able to see if you'd got that slightly misaligned. Um, yeah, really good fun. Um, we like challenges. It sort of keeps your mind working. This is a project coming up this year. So this is patterning. Um, so this is the ultimate uh, warbird flight. Uh, so they're the new display team. Um, well, they were new. Of course, COVID's now made them that little bit older. But incredible selection of aircraft, um, all run through uh, Andy Durston uh, and the Grace family. And so when they're on the flight line at air shows, um, these beautiful aircraft the seals on the canopies obviously aren't aren't great so we've got to do little sort of um touring covers and you know this was probably one of my best days ever you know at duxford uh at cywell just patterning you know bouchons uh spits and p51s hurricanes just awesome um yeah i, I dread to think how much that little lot is worth it's uh, <laughs> incredible um and yeah, what a team. And they all get to fly pretty much. They all just chop and change between the aircraft. So yeah, they're living the dream, really. It's uh, yeah, fantastic. So 
so we should be delivering those later this year the, the the rush suddenly came off it but who knows there could be an air show later this year which would be which would be nice to see again airability um we like to we like to support them and um again a bit more artwork and again those stripes just had to line up sort of at the back because otherwise it would look um it just yeah it would drive me mad for the rest of my life so yeah always tricky um but those are actually the previous one was material that made up the stripes uh this is actually painted so um there's a fabric paint that you can use um comes from the sailing world so a great big spinnaker i don't know if you've seen the vendee globe or the america's cup all those sails have the graphics painted on um, because they can use lightweight paints uh, and be really detailed with it. Um, and we use the same, if we're doing a great big graphic, we'll use the same um, because it keeps the flexibility and the cover doesn't get too heavy. Um, but yeah. And then this was where, this was probably our last bit of traveling actually. So February of last year, we went out to do military trials for a product that we'd basically dreamt up built and delivered within i think eight weeks and we got a call from the apache force which is uh, which is always great fun can you come down for the day and uh, talk to us about some structures it's like absolutely i want a guided tour of an apache yes please and um basically every year we go to the arctic um, to practice warfare in winter conditions and we're one of very few countries the norwegians do it and uh, the americans do it and so basically what happens is when they're out there with an apache if they've got a problem which happens quite regularly because of the sheer amount of uh, electronics in it um, and if they have to land out they've then got a really big issue um, what they'd normally do is if they had it and they were so far from home, they'd, if it was in war, they'd chop the rotor blades off, bring a Chinook and carry it out. Um, worse than that, they'd dispose of the aircraft or it just turns up into a, a, a mammoth task. So their, their sort of thing to us was, can you make a rapid deployment structure that will keep us out of the snow uh, with a couple of other little advantages keeping us out of prying eyes. And um, at that time, they were thinking about huge marquees that would go over the full width of the blade. And it's just like, absolutely not. You need structural engineering, you need ground anchors, you need all sorts of things. So what we did was we made an inflatable. But what we did was we cheated. We made the blades go out the side of the building so it, we could really compress the width of the building. The tips of the blades don't matter, they can be in the snow. Um, and to do this, to achieve this, we made two buildings that you can see here, and one has the slit in it for where the blade goes. So you bring in the two buildings, clamp it shut, and you're fully, um, fully protected from the weather. And this was our last trip, basically. We were in the Arctic in February last year, um, trialing it, and yeah, incredible and um that's what it looks like from the outside so you know the material uh gives you some protection from infrared um these guys here are just putting in a, a heating unit not that that's going to uh that will give you away pretty quickly the signature of that but you can fill it with heat um you can see the blower again there blowing away keeping it up um, and what they've, what we've got now is um, diesel run generators. So it's a self-contained unit that you don't need to bring a generator for. You just fire it up and go. Um, but yeah, amazing um, to do this. It's it's a very special material that allows you to go very very cold. Um, so it's quite heavy. But when it's in, when each half is in a bag, six of these guys pick it up and carry it. Um, and again takes 10 15 minutes to install um so they can because what they were finding was the scary to statistics was it was something like one hour in freezing conditions will take an apache eight hours to defrost five hours was taking three days 
uh, 24 hours in freezing conditions was well over a week. And no one had, fro apart from the Americans who froze an Apache for something like five days, um, they never got that thing working again, apparently, and they chopped it up. They just could never, they'd fix something, then the next fault would come, they'd fix it, next fault. So it was a real sort of a weak spot. And um, yeah, so we, we flew it out to the um, Arctic. And uh, yeah, it's um, great fun. Um, yeah, really interesting building to, to be involved in. And the next challenge is they want us to produce this to go on the deck of the Art Royal. Now that is going to be a tricky one <laughs> because, you know, when you say subject something to uh, conditions, that's going to have pretty much everything thrown at it. Um, but uh, yeah, so really interesting sort of project. Um, if I come back out of there. Um, but basically we're, so you, we're sort of, basically what we're doing is we're trying to do we end up in all walks of aviation, um, but we basically only take it on if we feel we can do it really well and we can always support it. So we never, we started with gliding and we still do huge amounts of glider covers. And that's where my love is. And we'll always keep doing that. And it's, it's a case of just, rather than dropping anything, we're just adding and increasing our inventory, um, which, just uh, keeps it interesting for everybody and what we what we find is we learn something new on one project and we bring it in to another so of course the um the one of the biggest issues with gliders has always been putting the wing covers on you naturally sort of catch the lining on the ailerons and things like this so more recently what we've done is once it goes over 15 meters to 18, 20s, your nimbuses, your ashes, we've, we've gone away from putting individual socks on to the wing is in one piece, but there's a big long zip. And actually, if I go back to, sorry, if I go back to screen sharing and bring across here, um, what you'll see is a very quick video that's a traditional way of putting the socks on, desperately trying not to catch the uh, aileron and wing tips. And what we did was we changed it up. So the tip is sort of sealed. So you can get the tip on, which just gives you stability in the wind. Unroll the wing cover all the way down. This is a Nimbus. And basically there's a one piece zip now. So you pull the zip up. Um, I think you'll see it on this side fast forward um so obviously if it's a bit windier maybe don't unroll the whole thing because it will just keep blowing off but yeah and so the difference was remarkable um it really changed it from uh minutes sort of eight eight minutes or something to put a wing on to sort of 30 seconds aside on your own especially with uh, i think that's 24 point I can't remember what that Nimbus one is, 24 point something meter wingspan. Um, and that was stolen from something else we were building. And it was just like, hang on a minute, that's a good idea. Let's do that and um, and sort of keep going really. Um, but I suppose for us, the future, um, if we're keeping developing, we I spoke about putting that plastic on and um, and sort of my limitations with it are always the weather, especially in the winter. And when I fly abroad to pattern things, um, I've got no idea what the weather is. I, I try to leave my flights last minute and try to sort of see a forecast, but so far, apart from once, I've been incredibly lucky. Um, and there was a 747 that was quite tricky, but I just sort of looked at the engineers and went, you're gonna have to give me a hand here. And there was sort of eight of us holding this stuff. But the future is now 3D scanning and 3D scanning for years has just been um, an unattainable price, sort of well over a hundred thousand pounds and struggled with white shiny surfaces, which of course that's gliders gone. Um, now the way technology has just gone in the last five years to a point where actually some builders use their phones to scan a kitchen. 
is incredible. And we've basically, um, it's a huge lead time, which Brexit hasn't helped with, but it's a handheld device that has a screen on it. And as you scan across the aircraft, you basically color it in, you'll get a color image on the screen that shows you anywhere that you've missed, but you get a full 3D model of the aircraft. Um, and the beauty of that is if someone is ordering, I don't know, just a cockpit cover, if I scan the entire aircraft, they could come back in 10 years time and say, oh, could I just have that bit to match? No problem. I don't now have to drive back to Manchester, Yorkshire, Leeds. It always never, it never seems to be around the corner. And, and just to finish off that sort of set. Um, and it just will up it just goes from layers there because with the scanning then you are CAD digitally designing the covers which then means everything is just perfect you've got every little mark you need on it for buckles and things like even the position of the label is absolutely where it should be um, and then you've got the automated cutting which works hand in hand um, at the moment we kind of do it it's not backhanded but it's not quick so i pattern it with the plastic then i lay the plastic down and i have a machine that runs over the top and i put a series of dots around the lines that i've drawn import that into rhino which is a cad system and then i smooth it out add the seams and things like this is quite a laborious task whereas these scanners now you scan the aircraft in get rid of random images your foot your knee things like that that you've scanned by accident get back to the aircraft and you can literally flatten it. So it will take the 3D image and just split it and flat it. And then from there, you've got the panels that you need to make the covers from. And the beauty behind that is certain aircraft like that PA32 at the beginning, the cowling is almost the same apart from on the port side where there's this great big air intake and it will just mean that you can make handed covers rather than you know mirrored covers that you then have to make little tweaks for and it's all using quite a lot of sort of judgment um whereas you can just be absolute um and of course if you go abroad i'm not limited by wind the rain it's probably not a great idea but i could use an umbrella um but my limitations suddenly go away and it's only sort of this sort of size so i can put it in my backpack I don't have to check it in, so there's no risk of losing it. And um, it, it's one of the many sort of changes that we're making. Um, and we're going pretty hard now into uh, innovation. So to go from 3D rendering to automated cutting, uh, and then we try and use, we've got quite a lot of uh, automated machines as well. So when we put buckles on, um, you put them under the machine, and it will put the buckle on, it will do a perfect, well, it's basically a union jack, a box, cross and a square. And, um, and all of that is going to be situated in uh, a new facility, which we're not that far away from getting hold of as well. So full custom made factory should be, yeah, should be a month or two away. Who knows, that's up to solicitors. And, um, yeah, and then we'll be really able to streamline. But what we're after is accuracy. When we first began, because I would pattern, I would then collect the material. I would then sew the covers together. Uh, it, it was just amazing how all of those distractions led to you forgetting a buckle. And then you'd ship it off to wherever. And it'd be like, oh, brilliant, but we're just missing this, or it's just a little bit short there. So right at the beginning, when we were learning the craft effectively, it was very much like, oh, little tweak here, little tweak there. Um, but now technology, you can really reduce that. And, you know, when stuff's going to America, it's, it can get really expensive in shipping to the point where you, you wouldn't want to bring it back to alter it. You, you'd be better off starting again. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to keep pushing forwards, keep doing different things. Um, we always get asked to sort of solve problems, which is where a lot of these inflatables come from, um, which is always quite good. You sit down and you just got to think, you know, horrible time, but outside the box. And um, yeah, so it's a, yeah, it's a little bit about us. Hope I haven't been too boring, but it's, it's, it's quite hard to sort of 
bring it together from the range of things and um yeah it's uh, it's quite good but i think um one of the best things we were involved in was the rugby world cup that we had here and the opening ceremony was a real think outside the box uh, and the opening ceremony began with um one of the players kicking a ball sort of trying to launch it up into the air and it was the old-fashioned rugby ball so brown leather and it went off and then it did this whole little bit of history and then the ball sort of came back into the stadium crashed into the ground and when the lights came on was a nine meter high rugby ball and then what they wanted was the outside of the rugby ball at the flick of a switch to go to white and be the match ball and then at another moment in time the outside of the ball had to come apart and, and basically reveal the uh, celebrity holding the world cup that was there to be won and that was just insane because I think pretty much it wasn't working smoothly up until the day because it was a development all the time the covers were all printed but on velcro so they tore away when a couple of set staff sort of ran away with a bit of rope it pulled those off to reveal the white then the individual sections of the ball um, were um, in solid inflatable so they were made like a um like a paddling pool sort of thing or like a lilo um and then yeah they came away and they revealed the frame and a lot of those cool things um we do um in conjunction with uh the guy next door so it's a full roundabout story i did my gap year working next door building the boat covers my first factory was down at warsash then we came to here um and then as the projects got bigger and bigger and bigger our unit just wasn't sufficient and they've got a huge sail making loft and so if you imagine when we make the aircraft covers they're nice and light and we do them on tables uh and it's all at nice working height the inflatable structures are so heavy you'd either not get them on the table or you wouldn't get them off properly so the traditional sail making is you've got the floor and the machine is in the floor. So the needle is working at floor height and it's really, it's just varnished wood. So it's super slippery. And um, so we produce all the inflatables next door on that space because we just, you'd end up building it and then you wouldn't get it out the door because we have to forklift a lot of them out. So a lot of these projects, rugby, um, yeah, the list just go, oh, it's crazy. But um yeah, it's all all good fun. <laughs> Have you got a picture or a video of the Rugby World Cup, Andrew? Uh, I reckon if I it's normally if I bring up uh, should be it's normally oh there she is yeah. So don't know if you can see that. So that is, oh, there's another image. So it's starting to come apart in sections. Um, this was when uh, the covers were revealed. So that's the brown leather coming away to become the white ball. Um, and then that's not a very good image. Uh, that was basically as it crashed into the ground. So, um, just trying to find. Yeah, it's um, that was it. I mean, it was impressive. I sadly didn't get to be there, so I helped. I, we were at Twickenham doing the um, the practicing, and um, yeah, so this was built. Um, yeah, complicated. Um, and then there was other. I was just trying to think. So it was, it was really center stage. Oh, there's the frame. So then there was a load of guys uh, and girls inside doing um, gymnastics and right at the top there in his hands is the World Cup. Um, yeah, it was, it was a phenomenal thing to see because when, um, when all the practicing and things were going on at Twickenham, it, it was full live rehearsal. So all of this equipment was out, all this pretend rockery, but it was just being made on the spot because the um, the time spans that quite often come with these uh, events is just 
by the time they've won the event, then decided on the theme, then worked out a budget, and then all the individual players that are going to do it, it's, it's incredibly tight. So um, some of the other stuff that they've done before us were, you just look at it, you just think you cannot get that done in time. And, you know, 24 hours and just go for it and see what happens. But it's, yeah, very intricate.